This is Join Us in France, episode 186. Bonjour, I'm Annie, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we talk about France, its many quirks, its history, its language, and of course, destinations in France you want to learn about because hopefully you'll be visiting soon. In today's episode, I answer this question. Is it possible to visit the Mont Saint-Michel in Normandy as a day trip from Paris, on your own, without joining a tour? Lots of people wonder about this, but is it possible or even advisable? Let's talk about it in today's episode. Join us in France. It's brought to you by Patreon supporters and Addicted to France, the small group tour company for people who want to enjoy France to the fullest with zero stress. Check out our upcoming tours on addictedtofrance.com. So it is going to be short, I think, because I am simply answering this one question. Is it possible to visit the Mont Saint-Michel as a day trip from Paris on your own without joining a tour? Well, of course, we'll also talk about how to go about that and we'll end on is it a good idea? Lots of people wonder about this because once you're in Paris, you're thinking, eh, the Mont Saint-Michel isn't that far, is it? And visiting the Mont Saint-Michel is on a lot of people's bucket list. So let's get into the nitty gritty of this plan. There are 360 kilometers between Paris and the Mont Saint-Michel by car. So that's 224 miles. Average drive time is around four hours each way, unless you get stuck in traffic. So this is the kind of distance where it's far enough away that doing it as a day trip by car might be a bit much. I don't know about you, but when I drive for four hours and then walk around a medieval city for six hours, which is about how long it'll take you to do the Mont Saint-Michel justice, I wouldn't be up to driving back for four hours again. But some people wouldn't mind doing that, so of course it is an option. Now let's talk about renting a car for one day in Paris. Car rental agencies are not open around the clock in France, not even at major train stations in Paris. So if you're on the clock, you want to drive off early to avoid commuter traffic jams. You'd like to really drive off by 6 a.m. if you can. So these are your two choices. You could go get your car at the Charles de Gaulle Airport, CDG. Car rental agencies there are open longer hours, although not around the clock. But to get there by 6 a.m., you have to leave your hotel you know, if you're staying in central Paris, at 5 a.m. So that's, oh, uh, <laughs> you're on vacation, folks. Or the second option is you could pick up your car the night before and park it in Paris close to your hotel overnight. This can be done. It introduces complications and extra expenses. And last week in episode 185, I talked at length about the fact that it's a bad idea to drive in Paris for most people. So if you're going to go with the early morning route, you you need to leave at you need to leave early. Uh, 6 a.m. is good because that puts you at the Mont Saint Michel by, by 10 a.m. Then you visit for six hours. Then you drive off again uh, by 4 p.m. to drop off your car at 8 p.m. as at CDG or wherever you picked it up, if they're still open, if you don't, if you're not going to CDG, and then get to your hotel by about not, you know 9 p.m. That's a long day, but I suppose it's doable. 
This also means that you're going to be at the Mont Saint-Michel at exactly the least desirable time because that's also when everybody else is visiting the Mont Saint-Michel. If you want better timing for your visit, this is what uh, I, I believe would work really well. Pick up your car at noon in Paris, get to the Mont Saint-Michel by 4 p.m. That's when the masses of visitors start leaving. Go directly to the top of the, uh, to, to the, top of the rock, uh, to the abbey, so you can see it before they close. So usually it's at 6 p.m., sometimes it's a little later. Check on the opening times. They change throughout the year, and I'll put a link to that uh, in the show notes on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 186. And then you stay as late as you can. Well, you're going to have to catch the last shuttle back to your rental car because you'll have to park a few miles away from the Mont Saint-Michel, as I've mentioned in episode 175. That was an episode on the history of the Mont Saint-Michel. And episode 176, that was a trip report on Mont Saint-Michel. The shuttles end their service at midnight. So since your car is probably a few miles away from the Mont, if you've had a long day like that, you don't want to miss that last shuttle. And then you drive back to Paris in the night. This is a really good plan if you are a night bird or if that, you know, depending on where you're coming from in the world, the jet lag might work in that direction. I, you know, I won't try to guess where you're coming from, but uh, it might work out. And if you're interested in more information about driving in France, I've mentioned it on most, many, many episodes, probably most of them. But the two main ones you should listen to are episode 16, that's titled Driving in France, and episode 138, Tips for Driving in France. So these are your driving options. Honestly, if I were driving, I'd either do the late departure from Paris or book a hotel near the Mont Saint-Michel. Or book a hotel near the Mont Saint-Michel. Um... A hotel, a good hotel for one night would be the Mercure Hotel at the Mont Saint-Michel because it's well situated. It's not that expensive and it's kind of a given, you know what you're going to get. It's a Mercure. They're all more or less the same. So I'll put a link to that also on the show notes. Now, how about taking the train to visit the Mont Saint-Michel as a day trip from Paris? There is no train station at the Mont Saint-Michel. Okay, so the train cannot take you all the way there. But since the Mont Saint-Michel is such a popular place for visitors, there are some really good options to get there by train. If you're wondering why there isn't a train station right at the Mont Saint-Michel, well, you know, there are 33 full-time inhabitants on the Mont Saint-Michel. So <laughs> putting a train station there has never been... Uh, <laughs> On high on the list of things to do. On the other hand, there are so many visitors that go there that there is a regional bus line that takes you the rest of the way. So if you go by train, you get off the train and that bus picks you up right close to the train and then takes you to the mall. And this is not one of those silly buses that stops all the time. It's a direct bus. So the total time between Paris, uh, Gare Montparnasse, and the Mont Saint-Michel is about 90 minutes on the bullet train and then 45 minutes on the bus. So with this combo, so a fast train plus a bus, it takes you two hours and 15 minutes. Even if things don't go perfectly, let's say two and a half hours, that's that's almost half of the time of the driving. So that sounds really good to me. So I'll tell you more about this option in a second. But before, let's talk about some bad train options that I want you to avoid because there are a few that would work, but not very well. So the closest train station to the Mont Saint-Michel is called Pont Orson Mont Saint-Michel. But that's 10 kilometers away from the Mont. It's not a really efficient way to go. Should you book your train ticket to Pont Orson Mont Saint Michel, you'd have to change you'd have to change trains in Rennes, which is the capital of Brittany. 
then get on another train to Pont Orson, Mont Saint Michel, then get on a bus that will drive you the 10 kilometers to the mall, but will stop in a bunch of places. And th those buses are not timed to um, be exactly synced with the trains. So it's not really, uh, I mean, it's possible, but it's not really effective. The other bad train option would be to get on a slow train. And by slow train, I mean any train that is not a TGV. TGV is the fast bullet train in France. Well, it's not, I mean, bullet train is in Japan, but the TGV is the fast French train. They go up, some places they go 200, 320 kilometers per hour. So that's really fast. So the slow trains, they, they are a little bit cheaper than the TGV and their prices don't change as much. The problem with the TGV is if you don't book ahead of time, last minute tickets will cost you a lot of money. Whereas those slower trains, you can book, you know, no hurry. And they are cheaper, but they take a lot longer. They're as slow as a car. So don't take the slow train. And some people, they can't resist cramming more things than they really should on a day like this. So they have the not so brilliant idea to take the train to, you know, Saint-Malo or Bayeux and then take a bus to the Mont Saint-Michel from there. That's a bad idea because there aren't that many regional buses between Saint-Malo or by you and the Mont Saint-Michel, and the schedules will not work out well. So don't do that. Now, Kim Henry on episode 106, she told us that she took the train to Bayeux and then joined a tour to Mont Saint-Michel. And if the schedule works out, why not? But it seems like way too much to me. And I, you know, I'm French. I believe in taking things slow if at all possible. So what's the right way to do your day trip between Paris and the Mont Saint-Michel? The right way is this. Take the TGV train and get on a bus line that's dedicated to taking you the rest of the way to the Mont Saint-Michel. This bus is timed to allow TGV passengers to get off the train, go to the bathroom, and then get on the bus just outside of the train station. And if your TGV is delayed the bus will wait for the TGV to arrive. And if the TGV is delayed so much that the bus can't wait that long because, you know, they, they are doing service both ways. They, they're, also, they're also taking people back from the Mont Saint-Michel to the train. Then they'll add an extra bus to serve the passengers who are arriving late. So it's not just any bus service. It's made to serve visitors who choose to take the TGV, then the bus to the Mont Saint-Michel. I'll put a link in the show notes for that. Their website is in English. It's very clear. They explain really well how to find the buses too. Uh, please check this site because uh, what I'm telling you is all true as of February 2018 as I record this, but things can change. But this really does seem like an excellent option. I've mentioned the TGV train a few times, but maybe some of you aren't really, you know, you're not familiar with your, that acronym. TGV stands for Train à Grande Vitesse. Between Paris and Brittany, it can do a maximum speed of 320 kilometers per hour. So that's 200 miles per hour. So yes, it's a very fun ride. And you only spend 90 minutes on the train. There is Wi-Fi on the train, but it's made for people who have a data plan, either a data plan from a French carrier or from a company that has agreements with a French carrier. So if you bought a data plan from anybody in America or in Canada or, or in Australia, your data plan will work on the train. But if you didn't buy a data plan, eh, bring a book. <laughs> okay, you will have to choose between two destinations for your TGV ride. Either one will work. They both depart from Gare Montparnasse in Paris, but they leave at different times and they go to different towns. Okay, so, so those towns are not n near one another. Your TGV destination should be other, either... Your TGV destination should be either Rennes, so that's the capital of Brittany, or Dol de Bretagne. 
If you go to Rennes, you will leave Paris, uh, looking at the schedule today, but again, that could change. You will leave Paris at 7.40 a.m. and arrive at the Mont by 10.55 a.m. If you choose to go through Dol de Bretagne, you will leave at 8.14. If you choose to go through Dol de Bretagne, you'll leave at 8.14 and arrive at the Mont by 11.20 Either way, there will be a special bus waiting for you right outside of the train station. There are other departure times, but those are the two that seem the most sensible to me. But of course, I'll give you a link so you can see all of the departures. I mean, you can search the SNCF website to see all of that. But you have to buy your TGV ticket in advance, like I mentioned before, because the earlier you buy it, the less you will pay. TGV can be really cheap, but you have to buy it like three, four, five, six months in advance. After that, it goes up a lot. And for the bus tickets, that's cheap and the price stays the same. You pay 12 euros to the driver. You bring exact change or as close to exact, exact change as you can. Bottom line is that the TGV train plus this dedicated bus service is a great way to go. I don't know if it's the best way for you, but it seems to me totally doable and enjoyable. But I won't lie to you, because the Mont Saint-Michel is such a touristy place, it's best to be there outside of the hours of 11 a.m. through 5 p.m. But depending on the time of year you go, this might... This may not be such a big deal. When you look at the site that predicts waiting times for major museums and attractions in France, it's called J'aime attendre, and you'll find a link to it on joinusinfrance.com forward slash links. They say that July isn't busy as August, other than the July for the 14th uh, weekend, uh, you know. And they also say that the last week of July is relatively calm. Now, the last week of August is awful because that's right before French kids go back to school. And yeah, if they want to put in a last trip to go something fun. The, there's a marathon um, around the Mont Saint-Michel every year. That's around May 13th. That's a really bad time to go. Um Any three-day weekends are bad. The days when there are going to be spectacular tides are bad. I mean, they're not bad. They're wonderful, but they're full, you know. So if you just go to see the tide and uh, photograph the outside, you'll be fine. But if you want to go up and see the abbey and all that, you'll, you'll just be hating life. September is a really good time to go. It's relatively low attendance and the weather tends to be pretty good in September. Of course, this is Normandy, so there are no promises. But I think if you have a choice between June and September, you'll get overall better weather in September. Now, I didn't talk at all about companies that will drive you there on a bus from Paris but there are many of them and use your googling fingers to find them because there's a bunch of them but i don't really want to recommend any of them because i haven't used any of them and i don't know any of them thank you barbara livieri shayla minor and saint george cass mcintyre and sarah root for pledging to support the show on Patreon this week. And thank you to all the other patrons who support the show month after month. It's really gratifying to have new people find value in the show and see that they want to give back. To support the show on Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash join us and thank you and if you want to find some other way to support the show you can go to join us in france.com forward slash support and there are several options explained there let me give you a short show update i am so excited to announce that the Amazon Echo skill dedicated to join us in France is going to be available soon. It's not ready quite yet, 
but I submitted everything I needed to, and things have made great progress. So this will make Join Us in France one of the very earliest podcasts to get its own skills. And I hope you will help me spread the word and let people know who are not otherwise podcast listeners that maybe they should listen that way with their uh, uh, Echo device. And for a personal update, well, it's been cold in Toulouse and all over France this week. I was hoping for signs of spring, which we got a few two weeks ago, but uh, no. The daffodils got fooled too. They bloomed early and last night they got frostbite because it froze really hard. And it snowed in Corsica and in Provence and pretty much all over France today. So for those of you who are coming to France soon or maybe next year, this time of year, please check the weather forecast and remember that this is France, not Southern California. It gets cold in the winter. And I'm getting new glasses. Yes, my life is that exciting. (laughs) Why am I mentioning the glasses? Because I got LASIK surgery in 2003, so that was a long time ago, and I haven't needed glasses since. And when I was a kid, I was blind as a bat, and I always had the thick glasses, and it was just terrible, and I hated them. And I was, I, you know, I was one of these people who was like nervous about, oh, I had to have a pair of glasses in every drawer because I was always afraid not to find my glasses again. Anyway, so not needing glasses between 2003 and now has been wonderful, but. I'm back to the point where the myopia is back. It's not near as bad as it was when I was a kid, but I can tell, you know, especially when I'm driving somewhere where I actually need to read the signs because I don't know where I'm going. (laughs) Um, So, and I've also needed glasses for up close reading for a while now, but I've been in denial about that too. But uh, at least I'm lucky. My vision can be easily corrected with glasses. So that's what I'll do. And that brings me to another thing that's kind of been on my mind, and it's kind of related, you'll see. Should I, should I get a new dog or not? My old lady dog, Luna, died a few weeks ago, and I'm faced with a choice. Do I get my own dog, or do I take care of guide dog puppies? It's really hard to do both. Let me tell you why. When you have a guide dog puppy, you're supposed to take the puppy lots of places. The guide dog in training goes anywhere you go, like stores, uh, the bus, the metro, the movies, the concerts, meetings, anything I do, the dog goes. But my own dog doesn't get to do any of those things. And dogs have a keen sense of fairness and unfairness and the look on the dog's eyes when they realize that you're taking the other one but not them is awful. So my Luna, she was already 11 when I started volunteering with the guide dogs. So as long as she got her long walk every day and plenty of attention, you know, she was okay. But I don't want to do that to a young dog because they won't understand. So for me, it's either go with my own dog or volunteer with the guide dogs, but I don't really want to do both. On the other hand, when you raise a guide dog puppy, you have zero say as to what happens with that dog. As long as, you know, as long as everything goes fine, as long as everything goes well and the dog is doing fine and the team is working well, it's great. But what if there are problems and you completely disagree with what the dog school is going to do with a dog? It's their dog. It's their decision. And that's hard to take. I've I've seen some examples of that lately, and it's it's not good. So I don't know what I'll do. I am kind of leaning just taking, you know, just getting my own puppy, because that's a lot less work than a guide dog puppy. I mean, the puppy months are a lot of work anyway, but when it's your own dog, then they're grown and that's easy. (laughs) But with a guide dog puppy, you get a new puppy all the time. And, you know, it's a lot of work. Um, And I'm, you know, I'm too busy as it is. But, but if I don't help out the guide dogs, I'll feel a little bit selfish, you know. But at the same time, I'm hardly the only person who can help out the guide dog school in Toulouse. I mean, there's a bunch of volunteers, so I don't know. 
But the breeder I want to get a puppy from will not have any puppies for several months. So in the meantime, I'll help out at the guide dog school and we'll see how it goes. All right, that's going to do it for today's show. Elise and I are supposed to be recording an episode in a couple of days, and that will be a rundown of Paris museums and what you can expect to see there. And, you know, we'll talk about the big ones, the minor ones, and things that will be interesting to you in those museums. And so I think that's what you'll get to hear about next week, unless it snows too much and she decides she doesn't want to get out of her house. (laughs) No, she wouldn't do that. Thank you for listening and welcome to all the new listeners who found the show recently. It's good to see new people. The best way to connect with me is via email, annie at joinusinfrance.com. Or if you have a question you'd like answered on the show, leave a message on 1-801-806-1015. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2017 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.